guys, welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. If you're not subscribed already, make sure you click that subscribe button. And also I link all of these videos in a playlist. The playlist is actually called Midweek Mysteries. So if you want more videos like this, find that playlist. I'm not entirely sure how to link it, but I'm sure it's maybe up there, there. Don't know, playlist is there somewhere. If you like this video, go watch more. So let's get into today's story. Now today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of a girl called Tara Calico. So Tara Calico was just 19 years old when she disappeared on the 20th of September 1988 from Belen or Belen? Belen, New Mexico. Tara was a Caucasian female. She had brown hair and green eyes. She had a large scar on the back of her right shoulder. Yep and also a scar on her leg, which I think she'd got in a car accident when she was younger. So Tara was a very efficient, scheduled kind of girl, something I can very much relate to. She planned out her days very well. She always sort of did the same things with her days. She just always knew what she was doing. So most days she would go on a bike ride um, and she'd always go the same route for about the same amount of time. And of course, this was no different on the day that she went missing on the 20th of September, 1988. Of course she was going to go for her daily bike ride. Now usually she would take her own bike but her own bike had a flat tyre so on this particular day she borrowed her mother's bike and she set off from the house about 9.30am and just before she left she said to her mum Patty if I'm not home by 12 o'clock come and find me. Now when I first read this I was like that's really strange because why would her mum need to come find her at 12 o'clock would she not know herself but this was 1988 I've got to remember that it's a totally different time period they wouldn't have had a phone on them. Tara possibly didn't have a watch so she was just like relying on her own timekeeping to get herself home so she just said to her mum, if I'm not home by 12, come and find me. And this was because Tara had a tennis game scheduled with her boyfriend for 12.30 that day. Of course, noon arrived and Tara hadn't arrived home. So Patty left the house to go and find her. I think she left the house about 12.05 p.m. She sort of went, I think she drove around Tara's usual cycling route and couldn't find her. And she really started to panic because like I said, Tara was very scheduled, efficient, organised. She would have stayed onto her usual route. And when she wasn't there, Patty panicked and called the police. Now, the police didn't actually take Patty's call seriously at first. Um, because Tara was an adult, she was 19 years old, and the police said, basically, if she wanted to disappear for a few hours, she could. However, this wasn't like Tara at all. Like I said, I've said many times now, she's very scheduled, very efficient. She wasn't the sort of girl to run away from home. She had no reason to. She had a very happy life where she was. Um, so, Patty obviously knew something was wrong. The police only began to take it seriously the next day when Patty was out on the route looking for her daughter and she found a cassette tape on the side of the road that belonged to Tara. Now the cassette tape was found about three miles away from their home and it was actually on the wrong side of the highway. So where it had been dropped, it looked like Tara would have been cycling away from the house. Later in the investigation, police actually found part of Tara's Sony Walkman um, about 19 miles away from her home near a campground and near where they found the Sony Walkman they also found a lot of bike marks and like scuffles in the ground. Now sadly Patty, Tara's mother, actually died in 2006 but for the rest of her life Patty believed that Tara dropped these items intentionally. She wanted to leave a trail for the police to find her. A lot of witnesses said they saw Tara on her morning bike ride that day but the last people who saw her said they actually saw her around 11.45am on her usual route and they said that she was probably about two miles away from her home. However, they did also say that they saw a Ford van closely following Tara. Now, they didn't know if it was actually following Tara or if it was just happened to be behind her, but they did say that Tara had her headphones on and her music blasting, so it's very likely that Tara wouldn't have realised this van was behind her. Now, something that struck me as interesting in this, at 11.45am, she was two miles away from her home, which makes me think that she was heading back home to be home for noon. And at this point, she had her Sony Walkman on her still. However, like I just said, parts of her Walkman was actually found 19 miles away. So Tara obviously realised someone was following her and started to like ride away and ended up 19 miles away before she got caught. Or somebody probably placed it there. That for me, it just strikes me as very strange because Tara was so close to home at 11.45 when she had to be home for noon. So it would have made sense for her to be suddenly cycling in the other direction apart from if she had realised that somebody was following her. Now in this case, there are two very clear possibilities. 
One of them is that Tara was abducted, and the other one was that Tara's death was accidental, but then it was covered up. First up, we're going to talk about the abduction theory and possibly the weirdest part of this case. Now, in 1989, in Port St. Joe in Florida, a Polaroid picture was actually found in a car park. Now, this Polaroid depicted a picture of two people. One of them was a girl who looked around Tara's age and she had duct tape over her mouth, lying in what looked like the back of a transit van, but the police could never obviously confirm that. Um, it looked like she was bound, but you couldn't see any ropes, but you could very clearly see duct tape over her mouth. And next to this girl in the photo was a younger boy, also with duct tape. And again, it looked like he was bound, but you couldn't see any rope. And of course, this threw a huge spanner in the works for the police conducting an investigation into Tara's case, because there was no denying the girl in this photo looked like Tara. Now, Patty, Tara's mum, actually believed there was Tara in this photo. She had the same hair, same colour eyes, same sort of skin complexion. But of course, the duct tape over her mouth, like, blurred out a big part of her face. So you couldn't really tell 100% if it was her or not. I think most importantly, in this Polaroid, the girl had a scar on her leg, which Patty said matched the one that was on her daughter's leg. And also lying next to the girl in the photo was a book called My Sweet Audrina, and it was written by V.C. Andrews who Patty said was her daughter's favourite author. However, something good to bear in mind at this point is back in the 80s, V.C. Andrews was apparently everyone's favourite author. She was a writer of the moment. So this possibly isn't as strange as it might sound. And of course, the police got in contact with Polaroid, the company, and Polaroid confirmed that the film that the photo was taken on was made only after May 1989. So the photo must have been taken after then. Now, this all sounds pretty convincing. It sounds like Tara, right? However, not necessarily. Now, Scotland Yard police detectives over here in the UK confirmed that the photo was actually of Tara. Of course, they analysed it. They used all the up-to-date technology at this time. And they said, yes, it is Tara. However, Valencia County police detectives also analysed it and said it's not Tara. It was analysed by all different police departments across the country, across the world and nobody could ever give 100% confirmation that it was Tara in the photo. There is no denying though that if the girl isn't Tara in the photo, that it looks a hell of a lot like her. Now the Polaroid photo has been a massive part in this case and obviously it adds an extra element of mystery to it. It's weird, the fact that this Polaroid is found in the car park, even if it's not Tara, who are these two children in this photo? Nobody knows. The young boy in the photo for a long time was actually thought to be a nine-year-old boy called Michael Henley who was camping in New Mexico with his family and he wandered away from his campground. Now again, this boy in the photo does look a lot like Michael Henley, there's no denying that. However, in 1990, Michael's remains were actually found very close to where he had gone missing, only a few miles away. And the police have said that it's more than likely that Michael died of prolonged exposure and therefore he couldn't have been the boy in this photo. It is actually very widely thought that this photo is a hoax or somebody playing a prank. Um, maybe somebody took it intending for them to think that it was Tara. Or maybe somebody took it as a joke and accidentally dropped it in the car park. Only one person really knows the answer to that question. Now let's talk about the other theory I mentioned, the accidental death and cover up. Now this is the one that I think the police believe is much more likely. And to be honest, once you hear it, it probably is. Now a man called Henry Brown requested an interview with the deputy chief of the police department. Now I couldn't find out the exact date of this interview, but from what I've been able to gather, I think it was a lot of years later, and I'm talking 10, 20 years later after Tara's disappearance. Brown stated that around the time of Tara's disappearance, he had been hanging out with some troublemaking teens from the area. Now one of these teens was actually Lawrence Romano Jr. And his father, Lawrence Romano Sr. was actually the sheriff of the police department at the time. Lawrence Jr. was apparently massively involved in drugs. He was a troublemaker and apparently he had a bit of a soft spot for Tara. Apparently he'd been asking her out on dates and she'd been repeatedly saying no because she'd already had a boyfriend. Now Brown said that he was partying with Lawrence Jr. and some of his friends in Lawrence Jr.'s trailer, more specifically in the makeshift basement under the trailer. Now I would love to be able to see what this makeshift basement is like because all I'm picturing is just a dugout hole underneath the trailer. Um, and I can't imagine it would be very stable. That's all I'm picturing, so correct me if I'm wrong. But I can't imagine it would be a great place to hang out and party, which is probably relevant to this case, but it just weirds me out, very claustrophobic. <laughs> 
Now Brown said that the talk of the party that day was how Lawrence Jr and his friends had accidentally killed Tara and then hidden her body. He said that they had hit Tara with their truck, they'd raped her and then killed her before hiding her body in some bushes. Apparently later on they took her body and hid it under a tarp in that makeshift basement. And then later on they buried her body in a pond. And after this interview, a man called Donald Dutcher also came forward. I think this was in late 2013, so very recently. He came forward saying the exact same story. One of the boys involved had confessed to him that this had happened. Now this all sounds very cut and dry, right? Like it's clear if these boys have confessed to multiple people now that they have killed Tara and hidden her body in a pond, then obviously it's definitely them. Why have no charges been brought forward? Right, the problem with this, like I said, Lawrence Jr. is Lawrence Sr.'s son. Lawrence Sr. being the sheriff of the Valencia County Police Department. And if this was Lawrence Jr. that had killed Tara and the police department knew about it, then they probably would have gone to some extra effort to cover up what Lawrence had done and actively not bring charges forward. Also bear in mind that these confessions haven't come out until very recently. All the suspects in this case are now dead. Lawrence Jr. died. There's a lot of mixed speculation as to how he died. Some people say it's a suicide and some people say that it was actually a game of Russian roulette. But either way, he is dead. So even if it was him, you can't bring any charges forward on a dead person. Now, say he had died of suicide, there was a lot of speculation that he had actually written a suicide note in which he confessed to killing Tara Calico. And a lot of people were saying that although the police knew of this letter, they didn't ever enter it into evidence because they wanted to protect the sheriff. And another question you may have is why wouldn't they look in the pond or the ponds in the area? Now the problem with this is obviously Lawrence and the other people involved in this crime never specified which pond it was. They never even said if it was definitely a pond, um, it could have been any body of water and you can't search everybody water. That's a lot of manpower and a lot of money for an investigation which may come up with absolutely nothing. The pond in which they buried Tara could even be dried up by now and her body could be like buried under layers and layers of silt. And to be honest, this was 20 years ago. I can't even do that sort of maths. 29 years ago that Tara would have died and would have been buried now. And if her body has been underwater for that long, that decomposition rate, like honestly, I doubt there'd be anybody there. I doubt there'd even be any bones left, to be honest. There's probably nobody to find anymore. I'm now gonna read you a direct quote from an article that I read about Tara's disappearance. Um, it's about the new sheriff after Lawrence Serrano Sr. like left. Um, the sheriff was Rene Rivera. I'm not entirely sure how to say the first name. It's R-E-N-E, -E, so Reen, Rene Rivera. He was the new sheriff of Valencia County. Basically, the quote says, 20 years after her disappearance, Rene Rivera, the sheriff of Valencia County, claimed that he knew what had happened to Calico. According to Rivera, the boys who knew her drove up behind her in a truck and some form of a car accident followed. Calico later died and those responsible covered up the crime. Rivera stated that he knew the names of those involved, but that without a body, he could not make a case. So to be honest, it sounds like the police department pretty much know what happened. But without Tara's body and without the suspects still being alive, from the sounds of it, there's nothing they can really do. I do think the best form of justice in a case like this, where no suspects are ever going to be able to be brought to trial, is that Tara's body can be found and she can be laid to peace finally and her family can have some closure there. But to be honest, I don't even think that's going to be able to happen. Because in my opinion, I do think it was the second theory that is true in this case. Um, and I don't think there'd be a body to find anymore, which is really sad. I really feel for Tara's family in that because knowing that the police know pretty much what happened, but they're not able to actually bring any evidence forward sucks. And to be honest, it's even worse that if they realise that the police probably did know what happened and they just covered it up. That, I think, just about sums up policing in America, doesn't it? Oh, controversial, I know. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. If you did, give it a thumbs up. As always, any missing persons cases that you want to hear about or just strange dead bodies or strange things that are happening in the world, I'll do a video on it. Just let me know. And again, make sure you click that subscribe button. Thank you so much for watching. Bye.